Yeah, go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the first seminar of the afternoon. Um, this is Dr. Alex Dittrich, uh, a lecturer here at Nottingham Trent, and he'll be doing, as you can tell, conservation grasslands for human and insect communities. Um, but yeah, I will pass you over to Alex now. Hello everyone. I'm going to use this uh, microphone because I'm fed up of raising my voice. Um, okay, so this is a slightly more serious talk compared to my one this morning, which is uh, about some work which I was involved with uh, up in Cumbria. So this is a project that involves Carlisle City Council, Cumbria uh, Wildlife Trust, all sorts of organisations, this is now Cumberland Council, because they've merged their councils together, um, on some conservation grassland initiatives and basically using uh, public and the community uh, in terms of conserving grassland. And grassland is often one of those habitats in nature that's overlooked as boring or messy. So we've done a lot of work to try and kind of offset that and make it kind of more exciting. So I'm going to talk about the urban rewilding problem and why conserving nature and urban and peri-urban habitats is tricky, how you can get the public on side, how I exploited students to the best of my ability to get the best possible outcome from these projects, because students are wonderful, we must use them wherever we can, and um, uh, how we can kind of like propel this forward and, and use these this next generation, effectively, of, of, of people to kind of propel projects. So, as you know, insect declines are accelerating in urbanised habitats. In urban habitats, these problems are really, really serious. But there's often an issue with messy landscapes and roles they have in conservation, because what people often see as messy, right, untidy, tall grass, lots of scrub, is great for nature but it's not so great for your neighbour that tells you to mow your lawn, okay? So it's about kind of understanding how we can kind of offset that. Um, so getting the buy-in from the public, getting people involved is really, really key for conservation. And I want to try and uh, get across a point here that you can do a lot for very, very little in this area of conservation. So a lot of my work is based in Carlisle. And when we think about... Carlisle, it's got uh, a lot of areas of high deprivation. Okay, so 30% are the most deprived areas in Britain, five in the lowest ten. So we have a lot of poor areas within Carlisle. And these communities, they don't go very far, they don't travel very far from where they live. Right? And we know that, conversely, having access to green space and nature is really, really positive. Right? So we've got a really great opportunity here to improve the livelihoods of these people on their doorstep with resources. Okay, so generally, uh, Carlisle is a fairly small city. It's absolutely tiny compared to Nottingham, actually. It's, like, it's, it's tiny, you can fit about a million Carlisles in Nottingham, probably can't literally, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, it's a lot smaller, basically. Um, and there is actually a fairly large number of parks in, in Carlisle. But, for the most part, a lot of these are kind of underutilised. And, and, and an unusual statistic here is uh, that 22% of that green space, that parkland green space, is actually golf courses. Which is really weird, because, you know, golf courses aren't that great for nature. They're not really that great for people either, because of the sort of prevailing risk of getting hit and over the noggin by a, by a golf ball. So people don't generally utilise them as, as kind of, uh, uh, as kind of uh, nature resources. Okay. Now the first kind of restoration project that I was involved in is uh, what we call the Swift, right? Swift's Golf Course. There's a golf course that unsurprisingly ran out of money a few years ago. Because this is a Swift Golf Course here in the summer, this is a Swift Golf Course in the winter, right? I don't play golf, but I'm pretty sure you can't play it underwater. 
So uh, therein lies a little bit of a problem. So in 2020, this was handed back to the council um, to transform it into a nature reserve. 1.6 million quid was uh, put aside for improving this, um, uh, this habitat from a number of different donors, including the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Highways England, Cumbria Waste Management, Environment Trust, loads of people, um, to try and manage this as a nature reserve. And uh, we as academics kind of thought this is a great learning opportunity to kind of understand how we can really, really improve nature for insects, but also kind of understand how the public kind of respond to these kind of things. So four hectares of dry grassland was created by uh, removing existing vegetation, um, planting wildflower seed plugs, removing non-native trees, there was a lot of um, quite old, um, dying horse chestnut trees there, which I know are great for saproxylics, silex, but the problem here is it's on a floodplain, so when those trees die, they become a real hazard, so they actually do have to be removed, sadly. Um, so there was this kind of balance between kind of making things kind of interesting and nature-friendly, but also safe. Um, using spoil from scrapes to produce buns that people could walk on the site, etc, etc. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward project in terms of generating a uh, nature-friendly habitat. But the first challenge here is ultimately what you're doing is you're creating a really scruffy habitat. The first initial stage of this rewilding initiative is quite untidy, tree deadwood removal. Um, uh, there were some complaints from people about removing these older trees. Unmown grassland can be seen as untidy. Access can temporarily become a problem because people can't use it for walking their dogs. These are all issues, okay? And this is our first solution put into action, which is basically using students. Um, now, at the University of Cumbria, we had a large proportion of students that are local. Okay, so they, they live and they work and they're known within these communities. Um, so they could effectively be used as ambassadors. We're having them working on the site, monitoring the site. When people come around and go, oh, why is this grass long or whatever, you know, you've got a student doing a survey there that can talk and engage with the public. This is really, really important. You know, if, if you're using a site, the monitoring isn't just great for... Um, understanding about how that biodiversity changes over time, it's really good to just kind of instill a sort of ownership on that site, okay? People see that site being used, okay? So we're using these as ambassadors, and we're using them as ambassadors for the entirety of their degree, actually. So we actually embedded this uh, Swiss project into the curriculum. So in the first year, we had... Um, students introduced to field skills and basic identification skills. In the second year, habitat mapping, taxon specific surveys. Then the final year, family species level identification and um, students taking on mentorship, taking on their own undergraduate projects, monitoring these sites. And um, it just seemed to work really, really well. It was a, a great little opportunity to, to give these students a real learning opportunity and also feed that back into the community so kind of get the understanding about uh, what's going on. So, 2021, things got a bit messy, right? So this is just after the first intervention, so things were a little bit untidy, so this is the messy phase. Set up some points. Three times a year we were doing some uh, fixed points. We were uh, using a suction sampler, doing some leaf hopper and plant hopper, surveys, um, we were doing some point counts for butterflies, setting up some pitfall traps for carabids, ground beetles. So we had a few different kind of uh, sampling strategies that were kind of like thrown in there. When you have students involved or inexperienced people involved in these kind of invertebrate surveys, though, there's always this issue of identification. It, in, insects in particular are particularly hard things to identify. Certainly um, accurately to species level but with this being 2020 
Um, we had access to really good digital imaging material and shared uh, OneDrive, you know, where we can kind of share information. And we actually put together a genitalia database of various different diagnostic features of our species. Because one of the things I learned very, very quickly is students struggle with the idea of, of working through a, through a taxonomic key, through a dichotomous key. It's tricky. But when you actually work through dissecting key features like the genitalia of an animal, although that's sometimes seen as an advanced step, it's really not. It's a nice way to get a conclusive identification on a species relatively quickly and be able to confirm it without having to sit next to that person. So that's where this kind of shared database come into play. You know, we were kind of self-checking our own identifications. It's pretty good. Uh, so I'm just showing you some, some early data here. I'm just going to skim through these slides. Um, 2021. Um, we just found 10 species of butterfly um, across 26 point counts. Uh, there were small differences between the control of the meadow and the scrapes habitats when it comes to the number of species. Generally, one of the things I found interesting though is the students were better at IDing butterflies than I was, right? I will say we were dissecting butterflies left, right, and centre. These were a species that was identified on the hoof. I call it invertebrate bird watching when it comes to, when it comes to butterflies. Um, there are some interesting community differences as well. This is uh, um, what's referred to as a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot where you can actually have a look at the differences in the communities between the different habitats. And you can see the meadow, the scrapes and the control have very, very distinct community compositions of the number of species. I won't talk about the maths there, but you can see you've got three different shapes. Those shapes relate to the shape of the community. So you have three different communities forming, which is quite interesting, so early on. Uh, when it came to ground beetles, which we were identifying from our pit, pitfall traps, um, we just compared two habitats, the meadow and the scrapes. You're seeing a massive variation in the number of species between the scrapes and the, uh, uh, compared to, to the meadow habitat, which you've got a sort of more predictable kind of number of species. Uh, but what's interesting here is you can see these two species accumulation plots and the uh, student identification is only really uh, missing a few species. Okay, So when you compare my own identification to what the students were finding, okay, the students were only missing one or two species, which I think is really good. Okay, often recorders they kind of will go through about a million verification steps to just accept records, but our students are doing pretty well. Okay, again, you know, community differences, big square, little square. We're seeing differences in the communities quite early on in this rewilding project. Uh, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, again, uh, slightly unusual differences in community difference, but there's a lot of overlap there. We are seeing, uh, again, some differences. The scrapes yielding more species than the meadow and the control habitats. Again, we're seeing a little bit of a divergence in the uh, identification abilities of your students versus your experts, but generally people are doing quite well. We are, we are using that student workforce to do some really, really good um, ecological monitoring. But again, the most important thing here is uh, having them on site and their presence there, really providing a sort of positive reinforcement for the work that we're doing. Um, I won't talk about this too much, but year on year we are seeing some some differences um, downward in terms of the scrape management, slightly positive in the meadow management, um, in terms of the change in the number of species. I might actually attribute this to uh, slightly, uh, shall we say, overzealous planting of yellow rattle 
Okay, because yellow rackle, as you know, it's one of those plants that people put in meadow because it parasitizes grass. It encourages um, flowering plants to grow where there would be lots of grass. Okay, but the problem here is there's a lot of insects out there that actually like grass and don't really like yellow rattle that much. So, you know, that's a, a pause for reflection there. It's not that great all the time. Okay, please don't plant too much of it. Um, so, yes, is it effective? This kind of data can kind of feed back to management. We can then feed this back with our information. Okay, so that's the first bit. That's our Swifts golf course over and done with. Um, this is a project that has helped kind of get people on board, public and students. We're using them for long-term wilding projects, we're using them for monitoring, we're using them to offset the negative perceptions of the public when it comes to dealing with these kind of scruffy landscapes. But ultimately what this did is it kind of snowballed into something much, much bigger. And this is something that I mentioned this morning, which is the wider parkland management project for Carlisle, which is using this idea of, of ownership to kind of encourage the council to more extensively manage their grassland. So here we have several sites throughout the city of Carlisle that have different management applied to based on our learning from the Swifts. At the time, we included QR codes, which linked information on what's going on, why it's important to uh, cut the grass, and again, subtle reminders, it's not all about the bees, okay? Now, we were seeing a massive increase in the number of taxa from the uncut grass to the long grass areas, but the taxa responding in different ways with some unusual species turning up around all over the place, okay? So we introduced a, a monitoring program which is pan traps and sweep netting, okay? I'm going to show you some data. Now, if we go to the May sweep net data, as you can see here, we have some beetles, we have flies, we have mitral bugs, wasps, spiders. Generally speaking, unsurprisingly, the extensively managed long grass areas have much more individuals in than your short grass areas. In August, you're seeing the same, you're seeing this increase in uh, long versus short habitats. And if we actually map this across our different sites, these are our different sites, right back, Moor Park, Hamish Plantation Park, Park Science Adventure Park, and home. You can see this lovely little plot here that looks at the differences between the cut and the long grass. And you can see that lovely trend and the numbers of individuals increasing from the cut versus the long grass. Really, really simple. You don't cut your grass, you get more species. Really, really simple. Okay? The only one that's not responding in that way is the flies, the vitro. And I would probably relate that to uh, something to do with dogs. Okay? <laughs> Um, you get flies all over the place, they're ubiquitous, you find them in short grass, you find them in long grass, and there's probably some evidence here to suggest that the mosaic of the cut versus the long grass is actually having some effect there, and that's probably the next thing that I want to look at. But you can't argue with this, okay? These small patches of extensively managed grassland are doing a really good positive thing for, um, for our habitat. If you look at the pan trap data, there's no evidence of uh, species area relationships, so the larger the area that it's cut isn't really affecting the number of species, but we are seeing pretty decent numbers of species within our tall grass areas, okay? So at the top we have all species there, we have our spiders, we have our beetles, we have our flies, we have our, what's that one I can't read, Hemiptera, so our true bugs, and we have our Hymenoptera, we're seeing some 
pretty interesting, de decent numbers of species that are turning up within these tall grass areas. So, generally, the number of arthropods is doubling. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing a doubling of arthropods in the tall grass versus the short grass areas. And if you work this out, as we've done using some wonderful beer map mathematics, um, if you're changing the management for a third of the site, this would at least double the number of insects you're fighting for a whole site. So in our parks, right, you, using the, the, the kind of data that we've got, if you change the management extensively, if you're reducing that cutting to just once a year, right, on a third of the site, you're doubling the number of insects. So that's pretty good, efficient bang for your buck, especially when this translates to a, the effort that's put in with the, with the cutter, okay? The councils are saving money by doing this extensive management, but the most important thing is that buy-in. If you've got your signage there, you've got people working on the site, then the public are in, right? So one of the other things that we've done is where we've got these parks that have got the extensive management, we're having schools involved, right? So we've basically handed over a part of this tall grass to a school. And we've said, this is your patch of tall grass. Use it as you will. So they have this kind of ownership within the community. They go home and they say, Mum, Dad, why are we cutting our lawns? You know, and hopefully this is perpetuating around the community. So yes, um, it's a nice way to councils to save a bit of money. It's a nice way to really, really improve your local diversity of insects with very little effort, okay? It's a very, very simple solution to what is a terrible global problem in terms of insects collapse. So, um, in the future, what are we going to do with it? So, annual monitoring involving the public and local recording days. We've got biological record centres involved. Um, getting this generational influence going with schools hugely, hugely important. Um, one of the next steps, actually, which is a bold step that Carlisle are very, very interested in, is actually applying for this um, National Park City status, which um, I think uh, Nottingham uh, should definitely put itself in the running for. Actually, we've got some great resources and potential for, for doing some things there. Um, signage, again, signage is really, really important. Getting the museums involved. We also had a few events that, that went really well recently. So the Big Buzz, Big Plant, which was a fantastic event that involved uh, a load of people. We got Dave Goulson came and gave a talk, which is really nice. If everybody knows who he is, really big name in insect conservation. So. A uh, very, very simple solution to what is a global problem has uh, attracted a little bit of the buzz. So, yeah, on that note, thank you very much. Uh, there are, are lots of people involved with this, so lots of acknowledgements and wonderful people. Does anyone have any questions?